Well, good morning. How is everybody? Man, I hope you're ready to have some fun today. Look at your neighbors. So we're going to have fun today. Welcome Facebook Live Internet Campus. Thank you for being with us. To give you a heads up before I kind of do a really quick review, we're going to be in Romans chapter 14. So if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn there, or if you want to find it on your, your phone or electronic device, you can do that. We'll be actually in verses um, 16 through 19. It's kind of where we're going to spend the majority of time, but I'll, I'll kind of read around that to give you the context. But if you're logged in, new with us, this is your first Sunday with us, we're in a series entitled As It Is in Heaven, and we're talking about a, um, a concept that we speak a lot about, specifically here at Epic Church, a lot. Um, we're not the only church that kind of views the world in this way, but what we're trying to do is help everybody see themselves, other people in the world with a kingdom perspective. Everybody say kingdom. Because in the Bible, when Jesus talked, he, he often talked about the kingdom of God. The kingdom is at hand. And so you'll, you'll sometimes, if you're new here or if you've been here, I just want to explain myself a little bit so you know what I mean by what I say. When I talk about or I downplay um, Christianity, I do that for a couple of reasons. The, the first reason is, is when that term was first used, it was not a term of endearment toward us. It was actually to make fun of us. Um, and the second reason is this, the word Christian or Christianity has this philosophy or idea around it, and it's, it's a lot like 21st century United States Christianity really doesn't resemble um, what Jesus came to do in God's kingdom. And so when I say things like that, I'm not saying you shouldn't be Christian. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is as a follower of Christ, let's develop a kingdom mentality because there are some things that we are to live in, accomplish, um, embrace, and understand that is really, really difficult if you philosophically think United States 21st century Christianity, but become very easily discerned, in my opinion, if you embrace a kingdom mentality. So when, when Jesus kind of kicks off this series, when we went to the Lord's Prayer and looked last week, we just kind of broke down the Lord's Prayer and said there's basically seven things inside the Lord's Prayer that helps us see, understand, know what the kingdom looks like. Those seven things were relationship, praise, purpose, provision, forgiveness, protection, and deliverance. So when Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, his disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray just like John taught his to pray. And he says, when you pray, say this, our Father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come. Everybody say kingdom. kingdom. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. <clears throat> so, Jesus, even when, when he's asked, teach us to pray, he says you need to pray that the kingdom comes, that God's will is done, and you want it to be down here just like it is in heaven. And so there's this, this lens in which Jesus views life, views the world, views everything, and it's called a kingdom mentality. Everybody say kingdom. So we're going to look inside the book of Romans where there's a statement, because oftentimes people, well, what is the kingdom? And so I just went through and found, found a verse, and there's a bunch that all kind of lend this way, but the one we're going to look at specifically today says this um, out of Romans. It's, it's uh, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but, and you could stick in there, the kingdom of God is, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So you really just want to know what is the kingdom, the Bible would say, the writer of Romans, Paul wrote the book of Romans, would say it's three things. It's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in, if I say in, in the Holy Spirit. So we're going to kind of look at, to help us understand and discover what exactly is being said right there so that we can know what the kingdom looks like, what it looks like in us, what it looks like outside of us. What, when we say kingdom of God, what are we talking about? Are we talking about a place, an idea, a philosophy? And so I'm going to do the best I can to explain something that sometimes sounds very difficult to explain. How many of you ever knew how to do something but didn't know if you could teach it? Like you could take something apart, you can fix something. How many of you in here are good at fixing something? You can fix something. Okay, it's one thing to be able to fix it. It's another to be able to teach somebody to fix it. Like he's like, well, sit down, I'm going to show you how to, 
fix this engine. And you start going into it, and you forget to tell them a step that you're super familiar with. Have you ever taught somebody something and just blew by something? Like, well, 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 now wait a minute, how'd you get from there to there? And, and in your mind, it's like, oh, that's easy. You just, and you said something, they went, well, no, no, that doesn't make sense to me. Because it was connected to something you did a long time ago, and it's here, and it's here. And so when you're teaching something like the kingdom of God, when you're teaching something like this, and it's something that is familiar to you as the teacher, oftentimes what you do is you blow by things that you assume, everybody knows what happens, right? When you assume that other people know what you know, or they're where you are. And so this may, for some of you, this may feel slow. What does that mean? You may say, okay, 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 get to the, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then I'll land on something you don't got. Let me know what I'm talking about. But what I want you to do is have like a lot of compassion for the different places of journey that everybody in this auditorium and everybody online is at. Because here's what I want. As we go into 2020, we are going to press this issue a lot. We're going to kind of hone in on understanding kingdom thinking because I, the reason the church is not as successful as I think it should be in the earth is because we've left kingdom thinking and embraced 21st century Christianity. I know that sounds harsh, and I don't mean it to sound that way. What I mean is, is we have to get a grasp on this because this is how Jesus thinks. So I'm going to read around this verse because you read it and you go, okay, the kingdom of God is not food or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy. Well, why does he say that? What is he really talking about? So we're going to be in Romans chapter 14, but I'm going to read around that verse so we can kind of deal with the context, which it does make sense um, for us in here. So let me put on my binoculars. <laughs> Stop laughing. Chapter 14. Verse 1. So I'm going to read a few verses here, and I'm going to jump down to 13, and then I'll get into hours. But I'm going to do that to build kind of the case of what it's talking about. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Look at your neighbor and say, you have an opinion. Verse 2. One person has faith that he, faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. I think that's funny. The one, just saying. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord when he is able to make a stand. Verse 13, therefore, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Everybody say love. Do not destroy with food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, this is where our verse picks up. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles. So that's a lot. That's a lot. So what's he talking about? Inside the, the Roman church, the church there in Rome, there were two groups of people. There were those who had not grown up um, inside Judaism. They didn't know anything about it. They were known as Gentiles. They just heard the message that God loves them no matter what, sent Jesus to die for your sin, and you come to him, you're born again, and they were fired up about it. But they didn't really know anything else. And so they were in church with people who had had the same thing happen, but they came from a lot of tradition. Everybody say tradition. 
So there was this argument about, whoa, like the Jewish side of the church was like, whoa, hey, Gentile, you can't, you can't eat cow. Like it just it ain't, it ain't going to fly. And you can't eat pork and you can't eat this. And you can't like, what do you mean? We, we've been eating that all our whole life. And they're like, well, yeah, but like that's, that's kind of offensive. And then, so these guys were over here were like, well, hey, you, you can't be asking us to cut off stuff of our body because I'm older now and I don't plan on, y'all know what I'm talking about? I don't plan on doing that. And they're like, well, you need to cut that off. And I'm like, I like it where it's at. And so there was this, if you do not know what I'm talking about, you have a conversation in your car later because I don't have time to get into it. Uh, every guy in here is like, I know what you're talking about. So, so they, it was a lot of bickering inside the church about what you can do and what you cannot do in this context concerning at literally eating certain food or drinking wine or, or drinking wine connected to certain things. Which, in some way, is not that much different than us now. Like, inside churches, we bicker all the time about what we can do and what we cannot do inside the freedom, if I say freedom, that Jesus gives us. And the Bible says that, listen, there's a lot more to this thing than your freedom to eat what you want or drink what you want. Actually, the kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So everybody say kingdom. So we're going to deal with the kingdom of God first. Because he says the kingdom of God is not which he says the kingdom of God is. Well, when he says kingdom of God, what is he talking about? Fun fact, inside the book of Romans, this is the only place that Paul uses the word kingdom. Now, he uses a lot of other places and things that he wrote, but in this particular book, he uses it right here specifically. So there's four things that I want to tell you about the kingdom so you can understand why he says it's righteousness, peace, and joy. And why he says it's not food or drink. But you got to understand what he's talking about. So the first thing is this. The kingdom of God means the reign of God or the rule of God, but not the realm of God. Now, some of you are going, okay, I got it. But some of you may not know what I'm talking about. What do you mean? So when you think of kingdom, sometimes we think of a place. This is not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the, the reign of God. He's talking about the place where Holy Spirit works and wherever the Holy Spirit works is where the kingdom of God is evident. So I want you to start to think right here because of that. I want you to start to think, where does God rule and where does he reign? Okay, so the second thing is this. The kingdom of God refers to his saving reign, his redemptive reign or rule, not to his powerful rule over all things. <clears throat> because in one sense, you could say the kingdom of God is everywhere because God owns everything, right? Right? But that's not what the writer's talking about. He's talking about specifically the redemptive reign or rule, the, the saving reign or rule, the sanctifying reign or rule, which happens inside the human heart. Everybody say heart. So the kingdom is about God's rule and reign. It's not a place. And it's also about a specific place. It's not everywhere all the time. It's in a specific place, which is why Jesus says this. Just plucking out of the Lord's Prayer. Holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, Jesus meant right there the same thing that this writer means when he writes it. The kingdom of God is God's saving reign, bringing holiness to God's name and joyful obedience to his word. So am I tracking with me so far? It's super important that you're like, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Okay, so the third thing is the kingdom of God is also fulfilled partially now and it will be fulfilled in a greater sense later so so the, inside the kingdom it's it's a weird thing it's like it is and it will be everybody say it is everybody say it will be so in one sense in first corinthians 6 9 it talks about how people who have not embraced jesus they won't inherit future tense the kingdom but on another sense, in Colossians 1.13, he says that when you, when you accept Jesus, you're transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light, present tense. So it's both, you need to understand we talk about the kingdom, it's a thing that right now is and a thing that will um, happen later. The fourth and last thing, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Jesus are the exact same thing. You may think this is very elementary, we don't need to cover that, but a lot of times, a lot of people have trouble embracing the Trinity, understanding that whenever we talk about God, we talk about Jesus, we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the same person. 
So it says literally in Ephesians 5.5, 5, everyone who is sexually immoral, impure, or covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. So, so when you, whenever you, you got to understand the kingdom, everybody say the kingdom, kingdom, has to deal with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So to serve any of those, to be involved in any of their working, that means that the kingdom of God is happening. So more times than we understand inside the New Testament, the New Testament, when it says the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or just the kingdom, it's literally talking about, everybody put their hand right here. It's literally talking about your heart. It's, it's saying that the kingdom of God, before it ever advances into a realm, into a place, into a city, into a home, into a marriage, it first has to grow in here. How many know that to be true? Like, I, I, can't, I can't do anything for you unless God has done something in me. So verse 17 says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking food, um, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the saving rule, the sanctifying rule of God, the reign of God, the kingdom of God has broken into this world, into our hearts, into our space and time through Jesus, who happens to be the king of kings. And the evidence, everybody say evidence. The evidence of his rule in your lives is not what you have the freedom to do, but what he's given you the freedom to become. Did I follow me? Because sometimes that's what we get, we get messed up in. We go, oh man, I'm saved and everything is permissible. Yeah, but not everything's profitable. You can eat whatever you want to. You can drink whatever you want to. But is it really a good idea? Because the kingdom of heaven is more than food. It's more than drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy inside the Holy Spirit. So to understand what it is, if it's righteousness, peace, and joy, and it is because Scripture says it is, we got to know what those three things are. The problem with righteousness is there's two meanings to it. So we're having a really like cool Bible study this morning. Hope you're good with that. But I don't want to assume anybody knows what righteousness means because there's two definitions for it when you see it in Scripture. The first one is found in Romans um, 4, 5. However, the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. That particular kind of righteousness is what's known as a right standing with God. It means that I have placed my faith in Jesus Christ alone, therefore God has given to me or placed on me Jesus' righteousness. Therefore I have a right standing with God. Not because of anything that I did, but because of what God did. That's one definition of righteousness. The next one is found in Romans six nineteen. says this, I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. What does that kind of righteousness mean? It's the kind of right way of doing things. How many know there's a wrong way and a right way of doing things? Okay, so this particular usage of the word righteousness is where Holy Spirit helps us discover the right way of doing things or God's way of doing things. The next word is peace. Peace also has two definitions, and they're very similar to the kind of definition that righteousness has. The first one is in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace. Everybody say peace. With God through Jesus. What does that mean? Well, we used to be an enemy, like an enemy of God. Like you just didn't like him. And here's what you say. Well, I didn't dislike him. I just didn't listen to him. Well, same thing. So there used to be this tension between us, and when you come to Jesus and, he, and you receive a right standing with God, all of a sudden, you're at peace with God. Everybody follow me? So the next definition of peace is found in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. It's the kind of peace that because Holy Spirit is in me, working in me, I can live at peace with you. Because I'm at peace with God, I can be at peace with you. Which one is Paul talking about? I personally think he's talking about the practically lived out righteousness, a right way of doing things. The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. It's living right 
in the world with each other. I think it's practically, how do I live out peace? How do I practically be at peace with you because I'm at peace with God? And then, what does practical joy look like? Like when I, when I, if the Holy Spirit's working in me, like I should kind of smile and be excited and that joy should overflow and therefore infecting and unfecting, affecting everybody around us. So it's the kingdom of God, his rule and his reign in my heart to make me more righteous, more peaceable, and more joyful. Everybody follow me? So this is the kingdom of God working in us. So what does he mean by food or drink? Does he mean like for real? Like what you eat? Can we eat pinto beans and cornbread or can we not? Can, can, we, can we drink a beer or can we not drink a beer? What is specifically he's talking about? Truthfully, in this passage, in the context of it, he's talking literally about food you eat and wine you drink, but also it's much bigger than that. It's, it's figuratively as well. So what he's saying is, is like, listen, 100%, you have come to Jesus. It's not about rules anymore. You, you live free in Christ, and you can do whatever you want to do, but you need to take into account that the life that you are living is an example to the God you are serving. And when you live for the benefit of other people inside a kingdom that is run by God, you can't just do what you want when you want, not because you're not free to do it, but because there are people watching. And it, it, the verses that I read, if, if it's unclean to somebody, guess what it is? It's unclean to them. And so what the writer is, I'll pause here to help people understand, especially if you've been going to church a long time. What he's saying is, is like, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. There are some people in the church who like to flaunt their freedom. And they would say they're way more spiritual than other people because I'm free to do whatever I want to. I can go out on the weekend and have a beer and I'm good. I can do this and I'm good. I can look at this and I'm good because I'm free in Jesus. Because I'm so free, I'm way more mature than you. Well, on the other side is a bunch of people who have this, this, um, these restraints that they have placed on themselves within themselves, and they go, well, because I don't, and 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 I don't, I'm way more spiritual than all of y'all, and you should be like me. And the writer of Roman goes, well, guess what? Y'all both jacked up. What you have failed to understand is, is that it's bigger than that. It's much deeper than that. It's not about what you do. It's about who you become. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy. And a lot of people say this, for, I've said this phrase. And so just, just know that your pastor is studying scripture and growing. And some things that I said four years ago, I would never say right now. So if you go back and listen to the messages four years ago, probably won't do that. I'm pretty sure I missed it somewhere. So I'm growing. And so there's this phrase, and it's especially true in um, the church planting world, and, and I did it, but I'm coming to understand um, the mistake of doing it. So we've, we've all said this phrase, God wants a relationship over religion, right? Have you heard, I've said that, you've probably said that, everybody says that, God wants, God wants a relationship over religion. That's actually not true. Turn to James 1, 27, if you don't believe me. I mean, it sucks when you find out you've been saying something and go, well, that's actually not true. Religion, if I say it, if I say it one more time. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The religion that God wants is pure. Now look, I know why I said that. I know why people say that. Because we, as a people, just like we've tried to define following Christ on our own, we've started to define words in the Bible on our own. And that word religion has become super, super negative. Here's what that original Greek word means. A worshipful lifestyle. That's all the word. You could break it down this way. It's a way to live life. That's what religion means. If you say, I'm religious, what that means is you've chosen to live a way of life. So what is it that God wants? This is a way that I should have said it. This is the way I'm going to try to say it from now on. God wants pure religion produced out of a relationship with him. 
That's what he wants. What, it, what am I saying when I say that? God wants a worshipful lifestyle produced out of relationship with him, not a bunch of rules, but righteousness, peace, and joy. So what in that context, in that reality, that was all like to get you to how to live. So now I'm going to tell you, how, so how do we live kingdom? If the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy, how do we live it? The first thing is this. Be submitted. If I say submitted, be submitted to the work of Holy Spirit. Because the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in who? I didn't say what. I said who? I say Holy Spirit. So what we got to do? We got to submit to the... Now, here's, here's the terrible thing about submission. It does not happen until you disagree. How many of you ever had Holy Spirit tell you to do something? You went, mm, no. Not doing that. Hey, you should probably, let's just deal with, the, let's deal with the negative side of it. Hey, you should probably not do that. And you go, mm, no, I'm going to do it. How many of you ever done that? How many of you ever been somewhere and Holy Spirit said, hey, I need you to do this? You went, mm, not going to do that. But you have to understand is what Holy Spirit is producing in you is the right way of doing things. If I say righteousness, peace, right, and joy. Now, here's what we think. Well, if I do that, that's not going to be very joyful. That's going to be very afraid. It's a threat. That's what that is. It's afraid. I don't want to. No. He's, he's like leading. So you have to be submitted to. And we have to be like very honest with ourselves to go, okay, the truth is I ain't that submitted. Right? Because we all come the same way. And this is not condemning. This is not, we just have to, okay, if I want to live kingdom, everybody say kingdom. kingdom. Then here's how you do it. You do what the king says, when the king says, how the king says. It's, it is that simple. I didn't say it was easy. I said it was simple. So first step to living kingdom is to be submitted to Holy Spirit because he will produce righteousness in you. Romans 3, 21 through 22. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. This is so dope right here. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ over all who believe, there is no distinction. Let me ask you a question. How many can remember when you first got saved? Just take a minute and go, yeah, I remember when I first got saved. So there's, either there's a bunch of lost people in here or y'all been saved too long. How many remember? Like, just, I'm serious. Like, okay, okay, I had, oh, I had that moment. Now, let me ask you a question. You got saved and, like, you cussed. And you went, hmm. Maybe I remember. Now, listen, very, very raw, very authentic. I used to say GD all the time before I got saved. Like, it was like my, I know for some of y'all, even lost, you're like, I would never say that. Listen, I was a heathen. Okay, so I used them all effectively. Okay, so I, I was doing something one day, and I said GD, and then I felt terrible. The first time in my life I'd ever felt bad for saying it. I was like, what? And then I cussed again. I said, holy. So in your conviction, if you're new, probably not a good idea to cuss for cussing, but that's just where I was at. Like, I, I was, like, new to this whole journey, and then I felt bad again. So I was like, Probably should just say anything right now. Like, it's like, I was like, what? What is the deal? Let me tell you what's happening. Because the Bible says all of us have a teacher. His name is Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit was leading me into a right way of doing things. And nobody had to tell me, hey, you probably shouldn't say that. And there were things that I did that when I did them, I was like, why do I feel bad for that? That makes no sense. Why? Because Holy Spirit, the rule and reign of God, the kingdom of God in my heart was leading me into righteousness. What? A right way of living. Had not read, listen, just got saved, had not read a word. What God promised to do? To write it on my It's the most beautiful thing in the world. So how does it get jacked up? Because people stop listening to him and they listen to other people. So here's another story when we first got saved. But they will say amen to this. Because here's, here's what's cool. You've been on the journey a long time. And there are things that Holy Spirit has told you not to do that you feel like you should tell everybody else not to do. Right? This is exactly what Romans is saying. Hey, 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 hey. Shh. Let the guy who just got on the journey be on the journey. Stop trying to fix people because you're jacking people up. So here's what happened to us when we first got saved. There was a group of 
very mature believers. They loved Jesus, but they like they did they did not watch TV. They didn't have a TV. Like didn't have it. So we had three or two. I don't know. We had a, a couple. All right. And so we just got saved. Ain't been saved long. Ain't been saved long at all. Like maybe a month. Maybe a month. Okay. Loving the Lord, getting crazy. Benay's raising her hands in church. Nobody knows why. We're in a church that didn't do this. And she was this all the time. And so, like, and then somebody had the audacity to say, well, she'll get over that. Don't ever, if I catch one of y'all saying that, somebody, bless you. Okay, so look. Um, so they came to us and was like, hey, you should get rid of your TV now that you got saved. I was like, what for? This is what they said. Because it's of the devil. I went, well, shoot. <laughs> well, babe, we're going home and getting rid of the TV. Here's what she said in her generous, who are we going to give them to? I was like, nobody, it's of the devil. <laughs> so what do you mean something? They told me it's of the devil. We can't watch TV. For the next month, you know what I was? Miserable. I was not more holy. I was miserable. Couldn't watch football, couldn't do anything. We sat around the house, tried to play cards. We, didn't, we looked at each other for hours. It was like, I need a TV. Here's what happened. You can laugh at that, but here's what happened. Somebody who'd been on a journey, I think at that time, like 35 years, had got a legit word from the Lord for them, and they assumed that was for me. Well, look, I've been saved four weeks. I was just, I was trying not to cuss every time I got convicted by Holy Spirit. And now you tell me, throw all your TVs away. I'm not saying it wasn't a good idea. I'm saying I was not ready, and they didn't know how to celebrate. He wasn't ready, okay? I didn't know how to celebrate our journey. So what am I saying to you? Listen, have grace with people that come to this church that do life, and they say they're a believer, and the first thing that we do is we judge each other. Oh, if you were a believer, you wouldn't. If you're a believer, you would. No, no, no. Like, I got out the baptism tank three months ago. I'm just trying to, like, figure this out. I'm trying not to, like, really hit you right now. I'm just not that saved. Right? So this is what he's talking about. Like, listen, let, submit to Holy Spirit. Let him produce righteous, a right way of doing things. You know what Holy Spirit's really good at? Giving you what you need when you can handle it. The next one is peace. He produces peace with God. I'm just, I'm just talking about for you right now. How many of you ever can remember, I can literally remember my children being this way. They would do something they were not supposed to do. And I would ask them if they did it. You know what they would do? Yes, sir. I was blown. I was like, no, no. I wanted to teach them to lie. No, no, no. You're supposed to say, no, I, like, I was shocked. It's like, you're totally like owning that. Incomplete, and I talk about like when they were like two or three. I'm not talking about last month, okay? Because what do we learn over time? We learn over time to lie. We learn over time to hide. We learn over time about shame. We learn over time condemnation. But like when a kid is first born and he does something wrong, you ask, hey, did you do that? And literally there's a short span of time. They go, yeah, <laughs> like proud, yeah. That's awesome, right? No, it's not. <laughs> Listen, when people first get saved, you know what the Holy Spirit tells you you have peace with your father and you will tell him every time you sin and you will not be afraid you will not think he's going to get you you will not be scared to go to his throne but what happens over time people tell you hey hide lie when the holy spirit's job is to create to help you understand no i got peace with my dad because when you mess up who should you run to god immediate your dad so like the whole, y'all, the Holy Spirit's like legit. He really does lead us into all wisdom and all truth. And then he creates joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Have you ever seen anybody that like, like ain't been saved very long and they happy all the time? How many, are, how many can just, how many can just close your eyes and see people coming up out of the baptismal tank about a few months ago? Like, now look, uh, Early on in the years of Epic, the water was like super cold, so people would come out, <gasps> and, we, and people were like, oh, I got the Holy Ghost. I said, no, the water's cold. 
they trying to find the Holy Ghost because they took all their breath and they got, but no, like, now the water's warm, it's legit, but people come over and they like, woo, they clap and we all get nuts. Why? It's because Holy Spirit produces in you righteousness, peace, and joy. It's people who try to steal it from you. People, people tell young married couples this all the time. Hey, you know, how long have you been married? Oh, we've been married about a year. Well, you get over it. How many married people ever heard somebody tell you that? They've been married a long time. They're like, a honeymoon, it ain't going to last that long. Well, look, you just slap them in the face when they say that. And we're like, you just need to go on somewhere. Because, look, if you're married, you can have, like, this honeymoon phase for as long as you want. You can be in love more next week than you are today. And listen, when you get saved, you do not have to lose the zeal, the energy, the joy, the passion. Is the world going to try to steal it? Yes. Unfortunately, well-meaning Christ followers will try to steal it too. You just got to listen to Holy Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. So kingdom living looks like being submitted to Holy Spirit. The next thing it looks like is living a life that benefits others. Inside the kingdom, you never live for yourself. You live for your king and you live for others. So when, when, when Holy Spirit's leading you into a right way of doing things, you got peace with God, you're like, you don't, you don't function in condemnation, and you got like joy all the time, here's what happens. You begin to live right in front of others and you'll like have peace with others. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Everybody say holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. There's literally this place where you're so like stoked all the time and Holy Spirit's leading and you're stepping in the right way of doing things and you like have peace with people and you're joyful all the time. Now look, people may not like that, but here's what they will do. Respect that. Because listen to what John um, 15, 10 through 12 says. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you That my joy, Jesus says, his joy, my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Right now, the church, the Christian church is shrinking. The next generation is not um, coming to it. And to be honest, they're not even coming to Jesus. Uh, witchcraft is the fastest growing religion in the United States right now. Why is that? If you interview that age gap and you say, hey, what's the deal? They would say, well, all the Christians look like everybody else I know. So I don't really know. There's no power in that. There's no life transformation in that. I mean, they, they, they go to church every Sunday, but the truth is they're mean. The truth is they're stingy. The truth is they still drink themselves so they pass out. The truth is they still do this, they still do that. And so there's a group right now that's watching us and they see no benefit as to why they need what they say, what we say we have. Why? I believe with all my heart that it's because we have allowed 21st, 21st century United States Christianity to infiltrate the church, when what Jesus came to do was establish God's kingdom, his throne on your heart, that you would walk in such a way that it naturally led you into life transformation, a right way of doing things, so much so that people would take notice that you're different, that you would live at peace with one another. It says, strive to have peace with You know the first place you're supposed to have peace with each other? In here. Are you always going to have 100% peace with people who are in the world, not in the church? No, but they will respect the peace that you have with your brothers and sisters. They will respect the life that you live, and they will see the joy that's on you all the time, and that will be attractive to them. Kingdom living is living for the glory of your king and the benefit of other people. Which is why it says in verse 18, because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God. Listen to this. This is mind-blowing to me. Pleasing to God and receives human approval. 
It seems contradictory because there's a verse in the Bible that says that we should live to please God and not be a pleaser of man. But right here it says, if you live the kingdom life, righteousness, peace, and joy, you will please God and you'll win the respect of people. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. What if you became a kingdom-minded person? And you understood that the kingdom is not about what I get to do. It's about who I get to become. And he works in me a right way of living and, and peace and joy. So much so that it pleases my dad. And it like draws the respect of other people. I'm not saying your boss will promote you. What I'm saying is, is he'll respect you. I'm not saying that family, mirror, family member will ease up on you and stop making fun of you. What I'm saying is they'll respect you. That's the number one reason people don't come to Jesus right now is because they don't respect Christ followers. I don't know how that lands with you. I know how it lands with me. And it's not meant to condemn you or make you feel bad. It's honestly to sober us up. The Bible says, think sober-minded. Judge yourself appropriately. Don't think too highly of yourself, but don't think too lowly of yourself either. Just be aware of where you're at on the journey and listen to the Holy Spirit. Let him produce into you a right way of living, peace between people and God, and joy that overruns, which is why Hebrews, I think, ends this way. Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Guys, the kingdom is not about what you do. It's about who you become. It is, in effect, righteousness, a right way of doing things. Peace, peace with other people. And joy, unspeakable. This overrunning thing. Imagine you made the commitment to just submit yourself to Holy Spirit. Okay. If he says go, I'll go. If he says don't, I won't. Whatever God says. And you like lived for the benefit of others. Like you came to the table not with what I can get, but what can I give? Guys, you would have the greatest life ever. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the, the simplicity of your word, but yet how it challenges us, inspires us. God, I thank you that it equips us and empowers us to live the life that you've called us to live in your kingdom. Holy Spirit, seal to our hearts and our minds this word today. And every foolish thing that I said, take it away. But every great thing that was said through me because of you, help us understand it, help us study it, be a part of it. Let it become us that we would become more like you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.